Good morning, church. Great to see you. I survived the trip with the in-laws. It was actually really good. It really was. It was awesome, wasn't it, babe? And we didn't need marriage counseling or nothing. It was awesome. It was awesome. So it's good to be back. Thank you, Pastor Bill, for, for speaking uh, in my absence. And uh, I'm going to ask you all a question. How many people like free stuff? Anybody, is there anybody that doesn't like a good giveaway? That's right. There's no such thing as a free lunch. That's right. Says the skeptical, and I get that. Which is why it makes it even more amazing that in Illinois, they launched this. This is called the Cash Dash. What has happened is, over the years in Illinois, they have accumulated, it says, more than $1 billion worth of lost or abandoned wealth. And this comes in the form of, it could be like forgotten bank accounts, or all the way over to full-blown estates that have never been claimed. I'm talking like estates, acreages, and mansions. And they say there are gold and diamonds and jewels and dollars. All of these things have been unclaimed and have yet to be discovered by their rightful owners. The director said this, and I'm going somewhere with this. See if you see where I'm going. He says, I hope no one misses out on the valuable assets that are just waiting for them. Needless to say, the minute they announced this program, Thousands of people rushed to claim what was waiting for them. Now, what about you? Do we claim what's waiting for us? You say, oh, pastor, you're getting all spiritual. You're going to make some kind of Bible analogy. <laughs> well, yeah, I am. In a minute, I'm going to. <laughs> but what if I told you that there are unclaimed riches here today for you? What if I told you that Scattered throughout this room, this very moment, are randomly selected chairs that have taped under them envelopes with various amounts of cash. Go ahead and check. You know you want to. Go ahead. There is something in this, in every single section, there is at least one envelope. Check under chairs. And if it's not your chair, you need to check the one next to you, okay? Because they have differing amounts, so you can... Check and feel and see if you are a winner. <laughs> all right? If you got one, hold it up just so I can see where they landed. If you got, okay. All right. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Back row. Awesome. All right. There should be one in this section. Have you found it yet? Miss Elsie's got it. All right. Okay. All right. You can open it up. Go ahead and open it. And let's see. What the Bible fairy brought you today. Let's see. <laughs> Open it up, and uh, you can use this any way to bless somebody. Teresa, what you got? Does it, is yours open? How much is in there? I can't read that from here. Okay, what is $50? Sweet. Nice. Nice. All right, Elsie, what you got? $5. All right, don't spend it all in one place. Anybody on this side? Yes? $10? Okay, all right, we're going up. 20? Fantastic. Oh, yes. All right. Okay. All right. Front row. What is that? A Benjamin Franklin. Woo, 100. Who says it don't pay to sit on the front row? <laughs> Y'all remember this. Y'all remember this. All right. I want you to use this this week in some way to bless another person. Your way. You pray about it. Just do it in the name of Jesus, okay? Any way that God lays on your heart. There's no right or wrong thing. Just do that. Now, I want to ask you a question. When you found that envelope, or you thought you might have found one, or your neighbor found one, did you notice the slight level of excitement? You see how that, that goes? What if I told you we have an even bigger gift, better than cash, better than jewels, better than, than diamonds or estates that is waiting for us, but so many of us fail to open the gift? This is where I get spiritual. God has gifted us his love letter to mankind. And it is the life-changing source for humanity. This is where we get to know God. In this, we get direction. And if we let it, we also get correction. And that's not popular to hear that these days. But I want to ask us some very serious questions today. There's going to be some lighthearted moments, but it's going to get real serious because this is for the bride of Christ. This is for the church. How do you feel about God's word? Do you trust it? 
See, I believe we can because not only can we trust what's in here, we can trust the creator that's revealed in this incredible book. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows every fact you're looking for, every question you have. He knows it. He wastes no words. He doesn't mislead. He withholds no knowledge from those who are seeking. His opinions are always right, and his knowledge is total. It's absolute. We don't think about that, but that is what we have. Because God wanted to communicate with us in a tangible form, he gives us the Bible, the book of all books. In fact, that's what Bible means. It comes from the Latin term, which means papyrus for book. That's it. It literally means the book. So we're going to dive into this book. If you brought your copy or maybe you got a digital one, open to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read from the New King James today, and then I'm going to switch over to the MSG, to the message, all right? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And I want you to notice what this first scripture says. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now check out what the message says. Look at this translation. He says, there is nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There it is right there. There it is. That is the home run portion of Scripture. Keep going. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes. Oh, we don't like that. And training us to live God's way. Through the Word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. That's powerful. Think about that. Wrap your head around this. God is transmitting from his omniscient mind into an accessible form a book. And he used the process called inspiration. That's a word we, we just kind of go back and forth with. We gloss over that. We think you're the inspiration. Chicago's great hit in the 80s. And, and we gloss right over this. But if you break that apart, that's two words. There's a prefix, in, and there's the root word, spire. Spire, as in respiration, as in God breathe. It is literally the same word we use to describe the air coming in and out of our lungs, meaning we're alive. It's also where we get expire, which is when you do not have any more air coming out of your lungs. You say, bless his heart, he has expired. That's the seriousness. That is what God has given by inspiration. Paul says he breathed it out. He spoke it, just like our lungs breathe out and form audible words. That's what happens here. God literally translated this using man. Now think about this. If he breathed into the lungs of Adam the breath of life, in Genesis chapter 2, if he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit in John 20, Think how powerful and real it is today that it says he breathed his gift of his word to the Holy Scriptures for you. Yet I got to ask, how much do we really treat it like that? Or do we neglect it? I mean, if you can wrap your head around, as, as audacious as it is to think every time we open this book, we should be able to picture our Heavenly Father standing there as real as today, speaking truth into our confusion. So many of us do this. I'll pick that up next week. And we wonder why we don't hear from God. Or sometimes maybe we're, we're so busy, we're distracted. We're surfing eBay or we're on Facebook instead of seeking the book. It's so easy to get distracted from God's holy word. Think about it. This is his very breath. It's as real as if he is standing in the pulpit sharing this. That is powerful. Remember, it's his words, not ours. Did you catch that? This is his word. That's why no man has the authority to edit this book. That's why no denomination has the authority to edit this book, to change it, to delete it, to say, you know what, God, we... Uh, we like your word. It's, we're, it's a bestseller. We, we're, we're very proud of it. But I uh, just want you to know that some of these things are <clears throat> they're a little passe, a little out of date. So what we're going to do, we're going to help you out. We're going to hire ourselves as your editor, and we're going to correct some of the things you messed up. That's exactly what entire denominations have done today. 
They said, you know what? You didn't really mean with that. That's so we're good. Anybody got the white out? Can you imagine the arrogance as that rises before our Father? Can you imagine? Gabriel, come, Michael, come. Look. Aren't you glad that they are correcting what I messed up? Aren't you glad, Gabriel and Michael, that humankind with their finite minds is correcting what I botched and my infinite mind missed? How could I have missed it? That's exactly what people are doing. Because they think they are the editor of God's word rather than the carriers. Y'all, we don't get to judge this. This is supposed to judge us. This is supposed to be the sharper than any two-edged sword, right? And it does. And sometimes I read it, and sometimes it's a mirror, and sometimes if i got to be honest, I don't like what I see, not only here, but here. So let me ask, just as your friendly neighborhood pastor, it's just us, and a few hundred people, maybe online here, how do you feel when God's word holds up the mirror to you? More importantly, what do you do about it? What do you do with that knowledge? See, in 2 Peter, we read this. We see prophecy never came from the will of man, but it came from holy men of God. They spoke as they were moved, literally carried along by the Holy Spirit. What a powerful picture here. They were literally carried along. There's a very short word. In fact, go back to verse 16. I want you to look at a very short, powerful three-letter word that we easily overlook. It's this first word right here. Some scripture is inspired by God. Is that what yours says? All. Say it with me. All. All. What does all mean? All means all. That's all all means. That's what it means. It's a wonderfully inclusive word that is incredibly exclusive and in what it's saying here. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture. The psalmist says the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19.7. The wisest man who has ever lived, Solomon himself, says every word of God is pure. Not some, every word of God. Scripture is supernaturally given by God. It originates with him, if anyone asks you, not man. This is huge. It's 66 different books written over a period of 1,400 years by at least 40 different authors from every weird walk of life that never even met each other. Doctors, rabbis, you had people who were fishermen and prophets and kings and shepherds, yet this book somehow has endured through centuries with a unified message with a single theme of redemption. Unchanged, protected by God's holy supernatural power, enduring with the theme running on every single page. There's no other explanation than God inspiring. It is truly given by God. So how do you do this? Think of it like a symphony, okay? You got all these instruments. Or better yet, think of it as your favorite rock band. Who's your favorite rock band? I, I, let's just go, I'll just pick a random Christian rock band at, at, at random. What am I going to put up here? Stryfer, exactly. Let's put it up. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> this is my favorite rock band that does Christian music. This is the Potter's Band. I want you to notice how different each instrument is. You've got bass, acoustic guitar, electric guitar. You've got, a, as Thomas is, from Amy over here, but they all come together and have this beautiful moment where we are week after week taken to the throne of God. I could see it on your faces. Sometimes that is the highlight of our week. We get to come and sometimes we weep before the holiness of God, or maybe we even weep over our unholiness. Did you know that is highly appropriate? Just like God speaks to them and puts this together and forms this, that's exactly what he does with men when he wrote this. Did you ever wonder how it happened? There's a story. I won't name the band, but a famous band in the 70s that wrote a number one song. It's a song, I think it knocked Freebird out of the number one. I'm not sure. It's one, these two, I won't name the song, but it has something to do with a stairway. And as they were being interviewed, the reports are that this spooky urban legend took shape where they said, how did you come up with such bizarre, otherworldly, haunting lyrics? And the reporter says his answer was this, you know what, I don't even remember it. I merely felt something take control of me and began to move my hand and the pen in my hand over the paper without my intent. <laughs> is that how God did it? You think of something spooky like that? He tells us. He says the Spirit of God came upon certain people at certain times and guided them 
to speak his words that they wrote, but miraculously he did it, check this out, without suspending their own personalities or their own intellects. God didn't knock them aside and make them mindless robots or automatons. Second Peter said, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now check this out. This is so cool. What I love is that identical Greek word is translated elsewhere when Paul is having his famous shipwreck in Acts chapter 27. Notice how it's used. Y'all remember this story? Horrible hurricane comes up, Eurachlodon and all these things come up, and it starts blowing the ship so badly that even these seasoned professional sailors like Hayden started freaking out, and they started to know, what are we going to do? And they were fighting, they were at the tiller, and they were trying to keep it going. And finally, the scripture says, they gave up and surrendered and let the winds blow it wherever it needed to be moved. And that's the same Greek word as moving in this inspiration. They literally surrendered. and let, Now, here's the deal. The soldiers on that ship, those sailors were still active. They didn't die. They didn't curl up in a ball. They were still active. They were doing other things, but they had surrendered control over where it would go. And so it is with the Bible writers. God himself tells us this very point in Jeremiah 119. He says, I have put my words in your mouth. So if someone asks you, why do you trust this book? You need to be able to tell them why you believe this. You need to be able to look at them and say, I am convinced of the divine authorship because this originated with God, not with man. This book has power to change your life. It changed mine. Y'all know my old testimony coming from a secular rock band, heavy metal thing on a horrible path, and God delivered me from that and saved me, and now I'm over here. Back in the 70s and 80s, all of my colleagues, they were singing horrible messages. So you had a choice. You could sing about trivial things like living it up and girls and partying and stuff like that. Or some of my colleagues chose a darker path. And they went into the realms of sinister things and even, dare I say, demonic. I'm going to put up two images. See if you know either of these guys. Anybody recognize these guys? Yep. Who's the guy on the left? Alice Cooper. Who's the guy on the right? Dave. Dave who knew that? Okay, all right, four people, and they're all in our band. Okay, all right, all right. Y'all pray for the Potter's Band. The Potter's Band recognized Dave Mustaine. These two guys, here's, here's what you may not understand. These guys grew up in a household that knew this word. In fact, Alice's dad, I believe, is a pastor. But something happened. They rebelled against this. In their teenage years, they left, and they started to explore darker things. I'm talking dark stuff, especially Dave Mustaine. Went into drug use, all kinds of stuff, even dabbled into the occult, all kinds of oppression. It's amazing what happened. But I want to show you the power of this. Guess what happened? Guess what happened? Scriptures fulfilled itself. Train up a child, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. He will come back to it. Do you know that both of these men are now back? This is how powerful God's word is. Back to the faith, and they are now proclaiming it, openly declaring their faith in Christ. It is happening so much. They're attending Bible studies. They are going to church anytime they're not on the road. There has been such a revival taking place in this industry that Decibel Magazine has actually done a new article about it, Heavy Metal Bad Boys Gone Blessed. Now, for the bonus round, I don't have any more money to give you. I gave it all, but can anyone name this guy? Close? Anybody? Anybody? That's Blackie Lawless the towering, beastly, six-foot-six, dark prince himself, lead singer of Wasp, whose albums and stage antics are so despicable, I can't even put them into words. This guy was broken by the power in this book. And he is now recanting and not even performing some of those songs. He can't even do it. And his bandmates have accepted Christ. And he has come, he said this when asked, what does this change? He says, I looked at the Bible and I found 66 different books written by 40 different authors spread over 2,000 years who lived on three different continents and most of these guys never even knew each other, yet somehow you see them finishing each other's sandwiches, yes. <laughs> finishing each other's sentences. He said, I love this, it's impossible that any man could have written this without divine inspiration. And then he closes this interview with this quote. He says, as I started digging deeper into the Bible, one day I realized I am reading the living word of the living God. Blackie Lawless. So parent, 
Don't give up on your kid. Grandparent, I'm talking to you. Don't give up. If God can rescue Blackie Lawless and me, there's hope. You're doing right. You're training them up. You're pouring the word. You're getting them here. You're getting them in the back in children's church. You're bringing them in odd hours to different camps, and you're hoping that this word will somehow drip and change and, and permeate their spirit. Don't give up. There is power in God's word. It is so powerful. It is the only place for truth. You know, he was so distracted, and he said, no amount of secular humanism was giving me purpose, but God's Word did. No amount of progressive liberal theology could explain why I was here, but God's Word did. I love God's Word. I love it. I love reading. I love reading different translations. I'm a nerd. I like to read different things. That's what I've asked for for my birthday coming up, a new translation, and I love doing that. Let me ask you a question. How about you? If someone were to come up and say, how do you feel about God's word? What level would you say you're at? Or more importantly, what authority do you give God's word to speak into your life? If you had to put it on a graph, if you had to pick a number, don't say it, just do it to yourself. I want you to look at this. Where are you in terms of allowing God's word to have authority, permission to speak into your life? When your lifestyle disagrees with the words of this book, what do you do? Who wins? All right, everybody needs to pick a number here because we're going to come back to it, okay? So take a minute. Are you two? <laughs> That's okay. You're safe here. I've been there. A five? Okay. All right. We see you. Seven? Where would you rate your zeal, your passion, your love for God's Word? And I want you to remember that. Here's why it matters. Because how you feel about this book will affect how much you study it, how much you apply it, how much you embrace it, and how much you allow it to have authority to speak into your life. If you do not have a high regard for this book, don't expect your children to. If you do not have a high regard for this book, don't expect you to have a passion to study it. I shared a story a couple years ago, something that when I was being convicted of how I was using God's word or not using it, reading it or not reading it. And I, I, I saw something, and, and I, I started to get convicted with how I was treating it. And I, I just thought of something so simple. It's so profound. It changed my whole family, and I shared it with a few of you, and some of you did it, and you said, that's phenomenal. I'm so, I know pastors who are doing this. Because what we usually do is we finish reading it, and we toss it in the back seat of the car or under the Taco Bell wrappers, or we lay it on our desk, or we put it heaven forbid, on a coffee table and use it as a coaster. And we have no respect. And so I was thinking about this, and here's what I did, okay? This is this very simple, and you can do this if you want to take this challenge. Anytime I am finished reading God's Word, I simply make sure that it sits above every other thing on my desk or on my table or on my shelf. I literally make it the highest priority on my desk. It's never covered with anything else. Now think about this. This forced me to realize this has value. I treat it, treat it if you will, as if it were more valuable than a bar of solid gold. Because it is. And my kids started to notice this. And it was so fun. I mean, it is so valuable. I've actually watched them. There was a lady who came and visited me. She wasn't a church member, don't worry. And I had my Bible, it was my, my big expensive study Bible with extra large print for my blind eyes. And I was sitting there studying. She came in unannounced walked up to my desk and set her purse and her car. I know, right? Set her purse. But y'all, can we just be honest? The bottom of a lady's purse can be nasty. You all set that down just like we set, like shoes. I mean, it's like, I know you don't clean the bottom of a purse. I get that. She set it down on my new David Jeremiah super-sized Bible and then her car keys. I didn't even have to say, my kids were up here. I won't tell you which one. One of them saw what she did, walked over, <laughs> how proud do you think I was in that moment? I didn't have to say, like, what are you doing? Get that nasty thing off. This is God's work. I didn't have to say anything. They got it. It changed. It was so simple. Now, hear me say this. This is not some legalistic thing. We do not worship this book. 
We worship the God who is revealed in this book. Do you see the difference? Okay. I just want us to all be on the same page here. Pun intended. You with me? Okay. This is something simple. If you haven't taken that challenge, try that. So 2 Timothy, Paul lists four things in rapid fire that I want you to take with you. Four things that are profitable. Number one, doctrine. Then reproof. Then correction. Then inspiration, instruction for righteousness. This is so cool because he takes it down a path almost like a road map. In fact, let's take a quick road trip today. Where do you want to go? It's hot out. Y'all want to go to Wet n Wild? It's too expensive. Let's go to the Fuquay Splash Pad. <laughs> no, that's scary. We won't go there. Let's do, um, you know what? We'll go to the happiest place on earth. We'll just do that. We'll go, let's go to the Magic Kingdom, all right? Show of hands. Raise your hand if you have never been to the Magic Kingdom. There's no shame here. You're safe here. Is that right? No kidding. Okay. All right. Tabitha, did you see these people? You come. She'll help you. All right. If you haven't been to the Magic Kingdom, if you haven't been, let me just translate it for you. This is, it's simply a people trap set by a mouse. When you show up, just hand over your wallet because Mickey will take good care of it. So let's pretend Paul is taking us to a destination as good as this. You with me? We're on I-95, right? That's how we go. And we're cruising down the I-95 of life, and we are headed. And the first thing Paul mentions is doctrine. Why? Because that is the starting point. Proper teaching, knowing that we need salvation, knowing that we have sinned, and not being afraid to call sin what it is. Preaching that with love, the whole counsel of Scripture, saying, this is right, this is wrong, God's Word declares it so. And I believe what it says, and I believe I am who it says I am, the good and the bad. That is profitable. That is the proper starting place. That is doctrine. So that's the starting point. We're in the car. We're driving down I-95 of life. But what happens in life? Something distracts us. Something makes us get our eyes off of Christ for a second. We glance over almost on the turn ramp. We say, what is that? And then we look over and we start to gaze at it more than at that. And as we start to get distracted, we're on I-95, right? So we see something looming in the horizon, something horrifying yet strangely enticing. We're not quite sure what it is, but we look and it is that. Raise your hand if you've been there. Oh, God bless you. You want to talk about nothing. So you pull off and you're strangely distracted, yet you're also bizarrely enticed about this sombrero and the $20 burritos at the one shop that's open. And it's kind of creepy. It's like a ghost town. You're not really sure how you got there. And it doesn't take long to realize, uh oh, I have made a horrible mistake. I should not have gotten off on this. In fact, if you ask Ron Bird, I immediately regret this decision. What now? Have you been there? That's what happens in life. We get off on the side road, and before we know it, Pedro and his 600 billboards up and down the interstate have somehow mesmerized us, done its voodoo on us, and we found ourselves in a place we never intended. Amen? Hmm? Okay, not just me. And we come, we think, what has happened? In situations like that, that's why we have the Bible. Paul says it is profitable for reproof. You know what that means? This shows us the wrong turn. This shows us our error, if you let it. This shows us, like God's Word, a mirror. It shows us our own iniquity. It shows us our own sin, if you read it. Can I make a bold statement? Don't come to me and say God is silent when your Bible is closed. Don't do that. I never hear him. I never know. Ah, God, I just don't know what your will. Have you read his word? No. <laughs> Come on. Killing me, Smalls. This is it. You're killing me. Sometimes God can issue a gentle whisper of reproof through his word. Trust me. You want the gentle whisper. Because if you don't listen to the gentle whisper, he is perfectly capable and justified by bringing a huge rebuke. Let's talk about the huge rebuke. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This is gold. Younglings, hear me. Never forget this scripture. Is not my word like a hammer 
that breaks rock into pieces. This is the powerful rebuke. God can do that. But he doesn't have to if we follow Paul's roadmap and we allow a gentle whisper of reproof, of correction, to take us on the right path. Some of us, can I be bold? Some of us are experiencing pain in our life because we refused the gentle whisper. We refused his correction at the early stage when that Holy Spirit tugged at our heart and said, shh, shh, get me out of here. This ain't right. And we went on, and we went on, and we went on, and before we know it, we are experiencing the hammer. Y'all, that's powerful, but it doesn't have to be that way. Hear the Holy Spirit give you that U-turn. And thankfully, the Bible doesn't just leave us there wallowing and languishing in that reproof, because next, Paul says the Bible is profitable for correction, it corrects our mistakes, and it gets us back on the road again. We can get away from south of the border giant sombrero land, and we can start heading to the happiest place on earth. And finally, Scripture is profitable for, quote, instruction in righteousness. Now that we're back on the road, we get to live and follow a way to keep us stayed on the right road, on the narrow road. So we don't veer off it again. An effective application of God's Word will do all four of these things. It'll teach doctrine. It'll reprove sin. It will correct false paths if you let it. And it will instruct us in godly living. And balance is the key. So as we land this plane, I want to ask you something. This verse right here in Psalm 119 says this, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. How are you doing with that? Do you have much of his word hidden in your heart? I love hearing these kids in the back quoting scriptures. Man, they, they know some verses I didn't even know. Man, that's awesome. Thank you, teachers, for pouring your heart into them. It all begins with his word. Today, we've looked at the importance of revering it and developing a hunger for it and knowing it better. Next week, we're going to explore how to apply it to our life, how to revere it, know it, and then apply it. I want to encourage you, as your friend, as your pastor, fall deeper in love with the God of this book. Spend time in it. Let it transform your heart, your mind, your thinking, and your act. You a, a gut-wrenching country to reach for the gospel. It is considered probably the most persecuted of Christians and the deadliest. Even to whisper the message of Christ can mean torture and death. So knowing that, under the cover of darkness... Several people in South Korea have gathered together and they are releasing helium-filled balloons with scripture verses emblazoned on them. Another missions group has taken another step farther and gotten bigger helium-filled balloons and they are attaching lightweight, small radios that are tuned to a message that speaks only Korean gospel Bible reading. There's a third organization who comes out under the cover of darkness to the DMZ, to the demilitarized zone, and actually has inside these helium-filled balloons flash drives with the entire scripture put on it in Korean. You know what they do? Under penalty of death, they risk their life. They love God's word so much, they value it so much, that they are willing to go up there, be on the border launch these balloons, and then they kneel and they pray to a very real God, Lord, would you please just send your breath, your wind, and blow these balloons into North Korea so that they land in just the right person's hands to hear your truth. They risk being shot or captured if they venture too close. Certainly persecuted. But they are willing to do that because they love God's word, which leads me to my final question. Do you? See, earlier today, we asked you to look at that chart, and I'll put it up again. You remember your number? Knowing what our brothers and sisters all over the world are going through, how many of us have seven, eight, ten copies of this that we never open? And they are over there praying for one copy. Or we take it and we throw it in the back seat with the Taco Bell wrappers and the Krispy Kremes. Maybe I'll pick it up again next week. Maybe. Might not even bring it. Might not access it on my phone. We'll see. You see the difference? Do you see the hunger? So here's my challenge. Before we pray, here's my challenge. Remember the number you picked. Next week, 
I want every one of them. This is a non-optional challenge. I don't do that very often. I want everyone in the sound of my voice, if you're just following along at home or you're in your car, go up one level in your love and your zeal for God's word. Just one. If you could do more and you want to ratchet it up, you say, I am done piddling around. I am going to, I am going to attack this. I am going to dive in and let God's word speak to me. Go more if you can. But I want every one of us to be able to come. And if you'll take that challenge, will you just come up to me sometime and just say, I'm taking that challenge, Pastor? Be in the hallway, can be out front, whatever. Let me know you've taken this. How's your zeal? Because a lost and dying world is looking at us to see, are we really people of this book? It's profitable, but it's only profitable if we open it. So maybe today when we open the altar, maybe you need to come and rededicate yourself right here and right now to begin spending time in God's word every day. Say no more to the excuses. Throw them out the window, open your Bible, and begin to delight in what God has to share. We started this with the cash dash and all those great things that are waiting. You have riches and gold and jewels and wisdom and correction waiting right here. But you got to dive in. Let's pray about it. God, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that you always speak. I thank you that it does cut like a two-edged sword, because, God, that's exactly what I need. Lord, I thank you for these amazing people who sit in this room today, who could frankly be anywhere else, but they chose to be in your house today. Lord, I thank you for your word that has spoken to them. What do you want us to do now, Lord? Help us to move toward you. Help us to take another step, to revere you, the God of this Bible, to have a hunger for your word, to study it, to know you more, and hopefully be better equipped to share the gospel with another. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, we'll stand, we'll sing the words to a final song. If you're a guest, this is a highlight of our day. No one will bother you. We like to open up the altar. You'll see a few people praying. Some will pray right where they are. Others will be singing. I'll be down front. If you have a prayer request, I would love to pray with you. Just be obedient to what God has spoken, okay? Let's stand together now. The words will be on the screen. I'll be down front if you need anything, and the altar is open. Be obedient to his spirit. You come.